Hello, Mrs. Ramos, and uh, hello to the AP Human Geography class. How is everyone doing uh, today? I want to give a special shout out to Raymond for your awesome letter I received uh, through Miss Ramos. And uh, that's going to be our topic for today. So, soil erosion and how does that affect economies? That's something we're going to explore uh, through this short video. So, first off, uh, I'd like to say that there are several types of uh, soil erosion. Uh, you have real soil erosion, you have shit so soil erosion, and uh, mostly gully soil erosion. Shit uh, erosion is when uh, the wind just blows over the landscape and blows away the soil and uh, deposits it into far off places. And uh, you also have uh, real erosion, which is when uh, land that is slightly sloping is affected by either rain, droplet, rain droplets or wind that uh, makes these small reels, uh, similar to what you're seeing here, reels that would assume that's a reel, and uh, the soil is uh, eroded uh, where there's a slight depression on the landscape and it continues uh, 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 chewing up into the ground. And eventually you get what's known as gully erosion where you have these big channels that are way huge and uh, really 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 big uh, depressions in the ground where soil has been washed away either by rainfall uh, sometimes by mudslides or even just by uh, continuous uh, wind abrasion on the landscape and so that can be a very serious uh, problem for agriculture especially that depends on uh, soil and uh, we all know that some of the greatest civilizations, uh, like the ones in the Crescent Valley back in the Middle Ages, uh, in Middle East, were actually based on agriculture. And therefore, agriculture is a huge uh, foundation for you know whole economies. And when that's in jeopardy, then uh, civilizations collapse, and we have seen that throughout history. And so, interestingly, erosion happens uh, everywhere. Uh, around the world in some places it actually is beneficial to the landscape uh, like for instance uh, wind blowing off uh, the western Sahara uh, desert carries out the sand and the soil and deposits it in islands in the Atlantic Ocean and sometimes all the way to the Amazon basin and that uh, rejuvenates the soil in uh, far off landscapes uh, so that can be actually a beneficial thing about uh, soil erosion but when you get closer to to, in, to you know certain regions, that can actually be a problem. Uh, and uh, certainly, Kenya is one of the countries that uh, faces uh, soil erosion on a continuous basis. Uh, and this mostly happens in areas that are either valleys or you know in mountains that have steep slopes, uh, because that's where erosion is most likely to occur. And uh, interestingly, that's also something I have to deal with uh, in my project uh, in northern Kenya. And actually also in the Earth River expedition, as I shall explain later on. Uh, but I'll start off with uh, Mount Masabit uh, because this is a shield volcano. Uh, so it's not a very steep or high mountain. Uh, it's it's wider than it is tall. So, so it has a very wide base around and it goes up to about... Uh, uh, 5,600 feet or 1,500, uh, actually 1,700 meters uh, above sea level. And uh, what's interesting about Mount Masabit is from a certain level, from about uh, 4,000 feet to the peak, it's forested and everything below that is uh, dry land areas. You have what's known as arid and semi-arid landscapes. And uh, below the arid and semi-arid landscapes, you have uh, deserts. So. A very diverse uh, uh, ecosystem and has very different what's known as ecotones so places where one one uh, vegetation uh, type meets another vegetation and that area where they meet is known as an ecotone so that gradual uh, change from one from A to B and uh, one thing about uh, Masabit is that we are facing deforestation uh, and also climate change through desertification. So it's a landscape that uh, uh, is being affected by both natural and uh, human-induced factors. And uh, my project is aiming to combat the both of them by actually planting trees around what's known as a buffer zone area around the cloud forest I mentioned. 
and uh, that should help stabilize the soil which then allows uh, vegetation to grow in turn supports uh, animals uh, and people who depend on the vegetation and of course we know uh, forests also have very many ecosystem services one of the ones I'm very interested in is actually water retention and how that uh, plays a big role in landscapes uh, around uh, Mount Masabit and how the water from the forest is actually what feeds oases in the desert landscapes all around. And so if we lose the soil uh, in such circumstances, then we lose the ability to plant the forest. And once we don't, uh, once we're not able to plant forests, then we have an ecosystem that uh, is going to collapse very quickly because the soil is the substrate that uh, gives rise to these great uh, ecosystems. So it's very important that uh, when we are working with the communities in Northern Kenya, that we are constantly thinking about how do we protect the soil first and uh, how does that uh, enable us to plant the trees and therefore have a better environment altogether. And uh, another thing I was, uh, it's kind of slipped my mind right now, but uh, if I remember, I'll get back to it. Uh, and for the Earth River Expedition, which is the second uh, project I'm also involved in, is uh, rivers are also at the same time, as I mentioned, with uh, wind carrying soil from uh, the Sahara Desert and deposited in the Amazon. The same case is with rivers. So rivers uh, are constantly eroding the highland areas. And with it, they take a lot of uh, sediments onto lower uh, basins and deposit those sediments uh, into into lowland uh, uh, areas or lowland valleys where the river starts meandering and it can't carry the load. So it's deposited on the side, sides, uh, what's known as sandbars. And uh, those areas give rise to very fertile uh, landscapes. And so agriculture, again, depends on on uh, movement of soil from highland areas to lowland areas and replenishes the nutrients in those uh, lowland basins. And uh, one thing about uh, that is that for there has to be a balance between uh, what's acceptable as soil being deposited and what's maybe too much uh, for a landscape. So with Earth River, because again, uh, the, the headwaters which are in Gong Hills and other parts around the central highlands of Kenya are being deforested uh, at a rate that is not allowing the river banks to stabilize. And so what happens is you get uh, soil just eroding down a landscape. And uh, when that gets into the river, the soil is carried by the water, uh, by the river flow downstream. And uh, it leaves areas upstream that are now you know, devoid of nutrients, essential nutrients for keeping those landscapes together. And so as much as it helps the lower basins uh, with their soil replenishment, at the same time, if it's too much, then it becomes uh, one side loses out and the other gets too much. And, uh, and then you have like uh, areas where, let's say, gr uh, rice is grown, rice paddies in lowland areas, uh, millet, uh, sorghum, like in Kenya. And uh, these places then get washed out with uh, too much sediments and the plants are destroyed. So we have to find a balance between what's acceptable as, you know, natural soil erosion and how that helps the whole ecosystem versus what's uh, too much for a landscape to handle and what are some of those uh, negative uh, influences they have. And so back to Raymond's uh, letter about uh, and his suggestion about uh, working with uh, governments. Uh, it's a very uh, important uh, issue uh, and it's something I'm always constantly trying to figure out how do we engage the governments because the governments uh, have more resources than we explorers do and they're ones who are most likely to effect change. We can do it on a small scale level but if we are aiming at you know the whole country uh, then uh, my, my team on the ground is not able to do that and that's where governments with their workers and their resources actually in a position to do so. So one thing uh, we do with uh, the Masabi Tree Project is we are constantly working with the Kenya Forest Service, which is a government agency, and trying to figure out what works best for different communities and different uh, recipients of the project. So you find that uh, some areas actually 
don't really need trees because of their topography and where they are located in the mountain, in Mount Masabit. So such areas are better suited to have grassland areas uh, and that also is an important ecosystem in itself. And then some areas are actually ideal for having trees and forests being planted. And so areas closer to the forest, the cloud forest I was mentioning, those are areas where we actually planted trees uh, strictly. But then you get areas in between the forests and the grasslands, that is where the communities live. And that's where we employ uh, something that's called uh, agroforestry methods. And so because the people are not, uh, uh, you know, essentially wanting certain forest products versus the other. Say uh, the community would like to have uh, timber, firewood, uh, honey, uh, fruits from uh, the trees they plant. And so some indigenous trees are not able to cater for those needs. And therefore an agroforestry project has a mixture of uh, uh, fruit trees. So it could be avocados, purples, oranges, limes, mangoes, so fruits that season throughout the year and they provide them with food, nutrition and also an opportunity to sell the, those uh, fruits at the farmer's market. And then we have, uh, so that's one, the fruit trees. Then we have uh, what's known as exotic trees. So exotic trees are uh, trees that are not essentially from uh, Mount Masabit, are found actually from, uh, from other parts of the country but do well uh, in the region and also have some benefits like uh, providing quick growing uh, timber, firewood. So exotic trees would do that. And also like for fencing uh, uh, people's uh, plots and knowing where the boundary is. So exotic trees are one of the best to do so. And then the third and most important one is having indigenous trees within the landscape. And uh, I'll be able to share a photo with you about uh, how we actually get to plant those uh, three different types of uh, trees within a landscape in Masabi. And the indigenous trees actually planted in between the fruit and uh, exotic trees because they are the ones who provide the home for the bees, for the pollinators, like the butterflies, the birds, the birds. Uh, they provide uh, nutrient recycling. Uh, some trees do nitrogen fixation. Uh, so that's very beneficial for for farming for farmers essentially, and uh, some provide shade. Some provide uh, alternative food for what would be pests on crops. So if you have planted maize, and uh, some trees would actually be what is a natural food source for these insects and birds. So they prefer to have what's uh, what's uh, more nutritious for them as opposed to attacking the farmer's maize uh, crops. So it kind of balances it out and also provides home for, you know, owls, snakes, mongoose, creatures that would uh, be very good pest controllers for mice and uh, grasshoppers that, you know, can swarm into large numbers and cause widespread uh, devastation to farmers' produce. So having this mixture of three different types of trees allows uh, what's known as value addition uh, over the year to occur to the farmer. So he's not just getting his crops planted and uh, having nutrition for them, but he's getting pest control services, he's getting water retention, he's getting shade when it's very hot, uh, he gets timber, he gets you know fenced, material, fenced plots, he gets fruits from the fruit trees, and he's able to sell that and uh, make money. So farmers uh, benefit a lot from agroforestry models. And we are working with the Kenya Forest Service, a government agency, on implementing these uh, systems in our project site in Northern Kenya. So governments are very important to mobilizing people and getting the support of communities and uh, also get it to expand the areas or the scope of projects because they have the resources, they have the manpower, and uh, they can go anywhere uh, they wish uh, within the country and uh, implement uh, these great ideas. So thanks so much, Raymond, for that uh, piece. I'll be definitely working with the Kenya Forest Service uh, to implement some of your ideas. And I hope uh, the class will also be able to chip in at some point uh, during this coming year. And I uh, just want to uh, let you know if you want to email me with some questions about the two projects, the Earth River Expedition or the Masabit Tree Project, then uh, feel free. My email address will be showing on the screen. And uh, yeah. 
uh, it's great. I'm so excited to be part of uh, this uh, program and I look forward to working with you over the next coming year. Thank you so much and uh, have a wonderful day. Bye.